I want to share something uh, with you, a picture that has uh, really captured me uh, probably over the last six months, really. Uh, you might recall late last year, I spent a little bit of time looking at the very first chapter of the Bible, and I said to you at the time that if ever there was an argument for why you should read the Bible, this is the chapter. This is, this is a remarkable section of the Bible in so many respects. And this is not, and I'm sharing with this with you today, not just a matter of academic uh, interest, although there is that too, but this, is, this chapter presents a picture to us that shows us something really profound about our lives, about who God is, what he wants from us, and what God does. The layers of meaning that come out of this chapter is truly remarkable. I said to you late uh, last year that the whole the chapter is, is intricately structured um, in a way that conveys its message at a number of different levels. From uh, it's, it's, a, it's a chapter that's uh, structured over a seven day um, period. The, the number seven was important in the ancient world. It was, a, uh, it was the number of perfection or completeness. Uh, the text is oriented around 10 divine commands. 10 uh, is a number theologically that's associated with uh, the, the divine law and divine just, you know, the righteous judgments of God. And so you get 10 commandments and, uh, and you get you know, the 10 plagues on Egypt later in the book of Exodus. And, and, and so this whole chapter has God said and God said and God said 10 times throughout this chapter. And then it has the line, and it was so seven times corresponding with that. And so throughout this chapter, even the number of times that individual significant words uh, are used uh, is flagging the meaning that's coming out of this chapter. And I'm coming back to this because there was still some good stuff there that I didn't really bring out, and I want to bring that out uh, tonight. And I, and I want to focus uh, tonight on actually the first half of the, of the creation week as it's described here in, uh, in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, particularly the first three days of creation, because there's a stunning picture here that to me is, is a stunning picture, and it's very intentionally depicting, uh, creating a picture here that is a picture of your life. How you see your life and God's role in your life is going to make all the difference. And these uh, first three creation days present a stunning picture picture of that. Now, but to make sense of this, I've just got to give you a little bit of background on, uh, on how people thought uh, at the time. The way that people saw their world, they saw it very much from within. You know, if we, if we look out into our world, if you can imagine being an ancient person, you look out into the world and you see the sky as a big dome and, uh, and you see the land and the land sort of ends in the sea. And for, from, as far as they were concerned, uh, the land is something that sort of sits on the sea and when you look up at the sky, it's kind of blue and they referred to that as the waters above the sky. And I just want to show you this picture. Um, this, is, this is kind of how they sort of saw things. Now, they, now, again, this is not a, they're not declaring dogmatically that this is, you know, they're not trying to construct a science, but this is kind of how ancient people saw the world. Now, the reason why this is important, because I love the way that God speaks into the way that they saw the world, this very limited way in, in which they saw their world, and creates an amazing picture, a theological picture, using this framework um, you, you'll notice the, the, that the, the dome here, it, there's this sense that within that dome is this realm where life is possible. This is the space, the atmosphere where they recognise this is what makes life possible, what God has put in this area. So there was this sort of life zone that they, uh, that they, that they saw here. We can take that down. Now, in, in a way, this is... Uh, it's often been commented and I've, on um, testimonials from astronauts that have gone out to space. One of the most common comments that I hear is that when they go out to space and all the deadness of space, that it, they're often very struck by the deadness, the inhospitability of, of space, uh, that, that there's just no life out there. And they look back at this beautiful planet that we've got and they're struck by the richness of life in this beautiful planet that God created. There's this sort of in the midst of all the deadness, right? There's this little life zone, like this little garden of Eden, this place where all the riches of life uh, is, is possible. And so that's what ancient people sort of appreciated it. 
But corresponding with that, their greatest fear, now if you think that, that they see this sort of dome, this area of life, their greatest fear was what they referred to, what they thought of as the forces of death and chaos. Because they saw that in a sense, all this, this realm of life is in some ways between the waters in a, in a number of, of respects. And they saw the waters as kind of symbolic of the forces of death and chaos. Now, I mean, if you've ever been out in the middle of an ocean when there's horizon all around you and, and it's, you know, heaving waves and it, it, man, it feels like chaos, right? You really feel exposed, quite terrifying. You know, you've been down the ocean where the ocean is crashing up against the shore and you're thinking, goodness, I'm glad that I'm uh, standing, unless you're a surfer, I'm glad I'm standing, uh, you know, up on the shore. It's kind of scary, right? This is, there's, and, and so there was this, association the forces of chaos with, uh, with the waters. And it was seen, as I said, yeah, the, it was kind of death and, and chaos. And what we see in Genesis chapter one is this, uh, is this picture. Uh, it's depicting how God creates this life zone, a life zone for us. Um, and it has a lot to do with the holding back of the forces of chaos and death, of pushing that back. Now this is important because it connects with another very important picture that comes through the book of Exodus. Let me just give you an example of this imagery. Uh, in uh, Psalm 93, it says, the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high, He is mighty. And so here you have, this is a psalm that's singing about God's might and ability to hold back these forces of, of chaos. So in the light of all of this, this is just a little bit of background. I wanna to read to you Genesis chapter one from verses one to 13. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the Hebrew, it's a beautifully uh, symmetrical sentence with seven, exactly seven words uh, in that sentence uh, in Hebrew. The, the next sentence in Hebrew is exactly 14 words, so multiples of seven are important. The last, uh, the last section in the creation narrative that talks about the seventh day is actually 35 words. So you get all of these, I mean, this is what I'm talking about, uh, how intricately well structured this, uh, this text actually is. So this is this summary statement at the start. In beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. The earth was formless and empty. That's a state of chaos it's described, formlessness, kind of chaotic. And, and then add this, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. So not only, this is a, in some ways a very terrifying scenario. It's like everything, uh, everything is covered with these sort of primeval waters and then there's just pitch darkness. Can you imagine that? Absolute pitch darkness. And then it says, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. The Spirit of God in Hebrew, the word is ruach, uh, which also is the word that, that means wind, and that's gonna be important in a moment. Um, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Why? Because the Spirit of God is gonna bring order, is gonna bring a life space where there's no life space. This is the important bit. There is no life space. It's not possible. There's darkness and primeval waters, and God is gonna open up by dividing, he's gonna, there's gonna be two acts of division. First of all, he's gonna divide the darkness and then he's gonna divide the waters two ways, this way and then that way, like he's gonna pull them apart like this. And again, this is very important for an image that we're gonna look when we just have a little bit of a look at something from the book of Exodus in the moment. Who's excited? I'm, this is exciting stuff for me. I'm having a good time here, so uh, hopefully you are too. Um, so verse three. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and there was evening, and there was morning the first day. So it's like this ray of light. In all of the darkness, God creates this realm of light. And this is a strong theme then throughout Scripture, uh, this theme of light, God being a light to our path, uh, and so forth. And then uh, it says in verse six, and God said, 
let there be a vault. Now, this is the slightly weird bit, and that's why I shared with you that uh, kind of ancient cosmological picture uh, there. Um, and God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so. And God called the vault sky and there was evening and there was morning the second day. So what God is doing is that he's creating a life space by kind of doing this. He's opening up the atmosphere, right? And creating this space for life to exist in. And then he does it again. So he's done it horizontally and now he's gonna do it vertically. Here we go, verse uh, nine. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. And God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. This is all, uh, th this is all symbols, very uh, pervasive symbols of blessing throughout scripture. And it was so. The land produced vegetation, plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. The repetition of that, it's actually repeated 10 times according to their uh, kinds, which is significant. Um, and there was evening and there was morning the third day. So God has created this life space, this place of order, right, for his people to live in harmony with him. Now what happens, and you, most of you here will know uh, the story, is that human beings reject God's order. And as a result, the world descends back into chaos. And in, as God's answer to the chaos, in a sense, to sort of give human beings what they're asking for, God sends a flood. And essentially, the way that the flood is described is that those, the, the horizontal and the vertical spaces, it's really interesting to see how this is described, they bang, close in both ways. So God shuts off this realm of life because if you don't want it, then I'll take it away. However, even in the midst of this great flood, God commands Noah to build an ark. There is a space for life and he fills all of these creatures and puts them uh, on the ark. So there is this life space that God provides and that is gonna prophesy what God is gonna do in the rest of the Bible. Because from here on, though the world in many respects is a place of chaos and, and there are various human means and human civilization. In fact, in the ancient world, uh, they saw the civilizations that they built, uh, many of the ancient civilizations, they saw their realms as sort of staving off the forces of chaos, particularly interestingly, Egypt, uh, Egyptian, ancient Egyptian civilization, uh, th this fear of the forces of chaos symbolized by the ocean was particularly fearsome to them. And they believed that the pharaohs and the gods of Egypt had the ability and the power to hold back the waters of chaos. Now that's uh, important with what's gonna happen to, to Pharaoh a little bit later. Uh, and some of you might know the Exodus story. And so even though there are these human ways in which we try to hold back the forces of chaos, it's almost like it's like the dike walls kind of, uh, of civilization, they leak, right? And that's because the cracks in the wall are in the human heart. And so it always keeps breaking down. The Bible depicts this, you know, the, the rise and fall of empires as the forces of chaos just again, a cave in again and again and again. But in the midst of all of this, in the midst of the rise and the fall of empires, right? The world system rises and falls. It's not as secure as you think, right? This is why uh, we're told again and again in, in Scripture, do not trust in the things of this world, right? It's not stable. It might look stable for times, but it's, it, do not put your hope in this. However, in the midst of all of this, in, all, in the midst of the chaos, and this is the, this is the beautiful bit, and this is the bit that is prophesied in that picture of the ark on the flood, is that God opens up a pathway of life for those who will walk in. In the midst of all of the chaos, God opens a pathway of life for us to walk in. And this is stunningly depicted. 
in the book of Exodus, when God calls a people to himself, when he establishes the family of his people and he calls his people to themselves and they're a very lowly people and they're in, they're in slavery in Egypt significantly at the time and he calls them out of Egypt. And when he, and it's, look, it's, um, this is cutting a long short story short. When he calls them out of Egypt, they're leaving and, and Pharaoh and his army, the Pharaoh and, of Egypt and his army, they're coming after this people of God, right? And God is teaching this people. This is the interesting thing is that in the context, God is in the process of teaching his people and saying basically to them, I'm calling you out of slavery into a completely new kind of life. You are no longer gonna be a slave to the system of the world, right? You're not gonna be slaves in Egypt. You're not slaves to that anymore. You're gonna come out and you're gonna live with me and you are gonna walk with me. And you know, they go through the desert and God is teaching them, right, how to live by faith. And then there's this very important moment, it's very, very well known when, they, when they're being chased by Pharaoh's army and they come up against the sea, the Red Sea. And the, the, it's, it's almost this moment actually you can feel, it's like the chaos is about to consume them, like a big wave that's about to crash over them and finish them off. They're about to be consumed. But this is what happens. Exodus 14, I'm gonna read uh, from verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I love the way he mentions it. Like, it's really obvious. Moses, why didn't you think that? Like, why are you freaking out? Just get your stick and go do the sea and part the sea, for goodness sake. What could be more obvious than that? Uh, so, uh, yeah, I feel like um, it's perhaps not as obvious as that, but this is what it goes on to say in verse 21. Then Moses, listen to this. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and all that night the Lord drove back the sea with a strong east wind. That's the word ruach. And he turned it into dry land. The waters were divided. And the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water to their right and a wall of water to their left. Again, for his people, God does this. He pulls it apart to create this pathway, to create this way where there was no way before, a completely impossible situation, and God pulls it apart to create a pathway through the sea. I mean, it would have been wonderful, but let's recognise too that for this people, this would have been in many ways quite terrifying. Because remember, this is a people that feared the sea as the realm of death and chaos. And they're walking through the sea and there are walls of water to the right and the left. Can you imagine how terrifying that would be? And yet, God is holding back these walls of water to allow his people to walk through it. This is not only something that God did, it's something that God does. This is exactly, in fact, the, the language in Genesis chapter one is this kind of language that is used, the way that God divides the waters to create this life space. God is saying to us, I am creating a pathway for you. Through all of the chaos, I have created a pathway for you. But it's a pathway through the chaos. It's not around it. It's not avoiding it. It will go through the chaos. And at times, you will see walls of water to your left and right, and you may be terrified at times. It may be terrifying at times. And you may feel like any moment you are going to be consumed. Surely, this is impossible, and I'm going to be consumed. But God's assurance to us is that He creates a pathway through the death and the chaos for us. He holds back the seas. We walk between walls of water, you know that. Sometimes we actually don't even sense this as much as we should sense it. Because there is so much divine activity around our lives protecting us from the forces of evil and chaos, a universe of evil and chaos of, of which we know very, very little. But God is has created a pathway for us and he is holding back the walls of water. We walk between the waters. 
we walk between the waters. And every now and again, God takes us through an experience that reminds us that we are walking between walls of water. And there are times when it gets really, really narrow. I wonder if you've experienced these times where it gets really, really narrow and you feel like the walls of water, it's like they're touching up against your shoulders almost. And you think, I am gone here. But God holds back the waters. This is his commitment to us. It says in Psalm 77, your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. You could even throw a present tense on that. This is not just what God did, it's what he does. Your path leads through the sea, through the mighty waters. It says in Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life. This is the, this is from this time on, the time of the Exodus, this language of the path of life. Because what God is gonna do, obviously, from this time on, you know, in the 10 commandments and, and training his people to live by faith, he is gonna train them to walk in his path. And this is the way it's described. It's always described as the path of life, right? In all of the death, in all of the chaos, God has said, God is saying there is a path of life. So Psalm 16, you make known to me the path of life and you will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Do you know, before the Christian movement was called Christianity, which it is now, does anyone remember, and this is, you see this in the book of Acts, what did they call the Christian movement in the book of Acts before they called it Christianity? Does anyone know? The way. They called it the way. Evoking the words of Jesus, I am the way, the truth, and the life. They understood it as a way that we, that God has opened up for us to walk in. We can be reconciled with God through Jesus because He suffered and died on a cross and, and forgives us of our guilt. And He calls us to step back at His side. And He says, now, we're gonna walk now between walls of water. I'm gonna walk, with, I'm gonna divide the waters as we go. I'm gonna divide the waters as we go. That is His commitment to us, to opening up away. As it says in Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Do you know we walk, folks, we walk through the valley of, sh of the shadow of death. We walk through the valley of the shadow of death. That's what this life is like. But his assurance to us is that though we walk through this valley for a time, that his rod and his staff, and he will guide us in paths of righteousness. This is God's assurance to us. There are times in your life, if there haven't been already, and there certainly will be times in your life, where you will face things that you don't know how you're gonna to get to the other side. You will see circumstances ahead and you think there is no way I am gonna to get to the other side. I am going to be consumed by this. But God says to you, and this is His promise to you, right from Genesis chapter one. It's not just what God did, it's what God does. He always does it. The Bible starts with this. God says, I will make a pathway for you. And you may not see it until you get there, you may not see it. You have to actually step forwards and walk in it. And as you walk in it, God says, I will ensure that there will be a pathway through that and you will come out the other side. That's God's assurance to you. Now, what He asks of us is that we stick to the path. He creates the path he creates the pathway. It's already prepared for you. This is the wonderful, this is the thing I love about this life is that I don't need to make a pathway for my, it's like, you know, chopping away through the chaos and the, you know, make your own way, that way of living. That's not, it's so wonderful for me to realise, oh no, God has already made the path. It's already made. What I need to do is walk in it. And there are times where you think, oh, I am not walking through the sea. I mean, can you imagine? God opens up a way, maybe we should try going that way. 
What about we just do a really quick runner that way? Or maybe we just turn around and just try and fight, just give it our best. You know, fight or flight. And maybe, you know, there are times when, you know, you're walking through the walls of water and you're looking at the wall of water on the right and you, you, you know, you rush off to the left and end up getting, getting consumed on the left or you look at the left and you run away from the left, you end up being consumed by the right. No, God says, you need to trust me with this, <laughs> right? Your job is to stick to my path. That's, that's, what he, that's the commitment that he requires to us. And it, see, the thing is, it won't always go where you necessarily want it to go. I'm sure the Israelites would have loved another way than going through the midst of the sea between walls and water to the left and the right. But I tell you what, they never forgot it. It's etched into the memory of God's people for thousands of years now that we walk through walls of water. I want you to say, it's like, I, I, wake up tomorrow morning and say to yourself, today I will walk between walls of water to the left and the right. Today I will walk through walls of water to the left and the right but I will not be consumed because God's firm commitment to us, mightier than the breakers of the grave, the seas have lifted up the summer, says the seas have lifted up their voice, right? It's like, it's looming over me. But God says, no, no, just trust me. It might get real narrow for a bit, but the way is there. I've made the way for you, right? So I want you to trust me. I want you to learn to trust me. You walk in my way. Jesus said, do not worry about all of these other things, but seek first the, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, his right ways. You walk in the right ways and I will take care of the rest. And what I'd like us to do tonight is recommit ourselves. There's such a, there's so much peace in this recommitment to realise tonight that God has already set a pathway for you. Maybe you, you might be here tonight and you're just exploring faith for the first time. Maybe this is all new for you. I've got such good news for you. The good news is that God has established a pathway for your life. Maybe you thought you had to invent your life as you go. Well, you don't. God already has created a pathway that's perfectly set out for you. And he just calls you to walk in it. He says, will you walk with me? Will you walk with me in this pathway? It's a path of fellowship with God. And he says, but you're gonna have to trust me because it's gonna get really narrow at times. It's gonna get real narrow at times, but I want you to trust me because I will hold back the walls of water to the left and the right for you. I promise you this. And God calls us to make a commitment to him Will you walk in my ways? Will you commit to this? And I'd like us tonight to use the symbols that Jesus gave us to commit ourselves to his way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we're gonna use the symbols of communion to recommit ourselves to God's pathway. But as we do this, there's a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 119, it's the longest uh, Psalm in the book of Psalms. The longest Psalm in the book of Psalms is a celebration of the way that God has made. It's like 150 something, 159, I, should, I feel like I should know that. Uh, you know, longest Psalm, and it's all a celebration of the way of God. And I'm gonna get uh, Jamie and Anna to uh, come up uh, and join me up here and I've asked these guys to sing uh, a section of this psalm. And as, uh, as we're doing this tonight, uh, we're gonna hand out the communion elements. Now listen, if this is, we're gonna use these symbols tonight, the symbols of communion, to physically commemorate uh, our commitment to God. It's, it's a way of celebrating His commitment to us and signifying our commitment to Him. Now you might be here tonight and you just feel like you're not quite ready for this. Is absolutely no pressure. We love the fact that people come and they explore faith in their own time, in their own way. There's no pressure. You might need to just think about this for a while. But if tonight you want to make a commitment or a recommitment to walk on the path that God has for you, to walk with God, then I encourage you to take these elements, the bread, a little bit of bread in the cup, and we're gonna use these symbols to say yes and commit ourselves 
uh, to that way. So what I'd like you to do, uh, while um, Anna's singing us this beautiful section of Psalm 119, there's an expression of commitment. We're going to take some time just to reflect on this, and the, the um, hosts are going to pass out the communion. I want you to hold on to those elements, and I'll come up, and we'll do this together. So thanks, guys.
uncertainty and the chaos, there is a path of life for us to walk in. A firm place, Lord God, where we can walk with you. And even as you speak, Lord God, the path opens up before us. And we thank you, Lord God, that you have reconciled us to you and put us at your side through Jesus. And we remember this, Lord, as we drink this cup which represents the shed blood of Christ and the bread that represents the broken body of Christ. We remember the price, Lord. We remember what it cost you to bring us back onto your path of life. And tonight, Lord God, we say yes, Lord. We say yes, Lord. We will walk on this path of life and we will trust you with our lives. And so as we eat and we drink together tonight, we hereby entrust our lives completely to you. God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from his sanctuary and may he grant you support from Zion. May he remember your sacrifices and your offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and may he make all of your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our.